Hello everyone, uh, this is Al Fadi, and uh, we're going to continue today uh, with another episode in this uh, fabulous series about refuting the claim that the Quran has scientific miracles in it. So far, really, we covered a whole uh, bunch of those uh, claims, and I'm going to let uh, my guest here, Dr. Jay Smith, who have done an amazing job. Uh, and partnered with me and taken him one claim at the time. I'm going to let him really summarize everything we've covered so far and then dive into another topic related to this. Jay, welcome aboard, brother. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun that we've had this chance to do these episodes, especially since neither of us are scientists. That's right. We did it because this was kind of foisted on us by Nadir Ahmed. We can give thanks to Nadir Ahmed who are even creating the need to answer these, a man who has spent his whole last 11 years on this very subject, defines himself by this subject. This is his signature piece and could not even defend one of these when we brought them up on the night, S turned the debate into attacking the mustard seed and uh, the virginity uh, test of Deuteronomy 22. Now, let's, let's do a review of what we've looked at. Uh, we have looked at a number of scientific problems. We've looked at whether or not in chapter 31, verse 10, uh, that God has put earths on the, uh, the mountains on the earth to keep them from shaking, uh, which is very clear in chapter 31, 10, and we saw that this, had, this was pre-scientific. Uh, we now know very well that tectonic plates and volcanic action are the two different sources of thrusting and slippage. Uh, these are done very clearly uh, over hundreds and thousands and thousands of years, but we now know that tectonic plates colliding create wrinkle in the Earth's surface. We know that volcanic action creates earth uh, in islands, making islands in, uh, in, the, in the oceans. And there, everywhere you see volcanoes and everywhere you are on earth, I'm sorry, on mountains, there is shaking. That's right. Which means if he places them there to keep them in shape, they're doing a pretty lousy job. And they, they split. That's the fault line. I mean, why would they split if they're there to stabilize things? Like the Andreas Fault in exactly. California. Yeah. So they are the result of shaking. Who, not only did it, is that wrong, but also it shows that this is from a very anthropomorphic standpoint, from a man-made standpoint. This is what man would see, seeing those large objects. We went into other areas. We took looked at the the whole problem with communities, that communities, that all animals and insects are just like humans, and we looked at the spiders and said, no, they're not. That actually is an error. We moved into uh, areas such as where does the semen come from, that it comes between the kidney and the backbone, says, no, it's not in my, not in my body, not in your body. Uh, if, the, if I were dependent on that, I wouldn't have any sons today. You wouldn't have any children as, as well. Uh, we looked at where honey comes from and the reference there that it, that the bees may get uh, eat the the fruit, and from the fruit, they then make honey within their abdomen, if you read the Quran correctly. It shows that there are a number of errors, and they were not all female bees. In fact, the word that was used, as you saw in Arabic, was male bees. So That's even right. that got it wrong, because we know the ones that do all the work in a bee colony are females. That's right. So three errors that we pulled we out there. We want to thank Nader Ahmed for bringing that up. We found out that the cow's milk, I love milk, but I don't like it anymore if I was going to follow the Quran, because it's made between the excrement and the blood. <laughs> I don't think that I'd want to have cows make once I know that, or that the sun sets in a pond. And then we followed that up with the whole thing of the cycles, the moon and the sun cycles. That's right. And, and we looked, we saw chapter 91, verse uh, 1 and 2, uh, chapter 36, verse 40, that actually one follows the other. It's not a cycle that goes out into the solar system. Correct. It's following around the earth, which then helps us to understand why the Quran suggests it sets in a pond, then it comes up the other way in chapter 18. And that's why when... Uh, Dual Karnain, Alexander the Great went to the east, saw it setting, and saw it coming up near people, people who were near the sun. If it's coming up in the in the east and going down in the west, if they're near the sun, they're no more near than you and I to the sun. That's right. <coughs> Can you see, these are error after error after error. This is all from man's standpoint. It's also, it also was fascinating when we looked at Solomon. And we looked at Solomon who was able to talk. Let me just take a drink while I'm going here. You can go on from there. Uh, you know, what I want to say to our friends here is uh, what we did so far is just a handful of things. Uh, we wanted to at least address some of the most, you know, uh, 
popular one if you wish you know that doesn't mean this is the exhaustive list we are going to continue and depending on what interactions we're going to get from people we'll decide uh, <coughs> how much longer we're going to go with this because uh, this is a topic that we discovered myself and dr j smith no one took it seriously no one refuted it seriously there are no videos like this you find like some amateur work that is taking place uh, but we wanted to debunk these things one at the time we then went into uh, Solomon, and Solomon, who is able to talk, to listen to Bert, I'm sorry, he does that, but he also listens to ants, and yet we found out now that ants don't talk. They actually exchange using their antennae pheromones between, a chemical exchange between Correct. them, unless Solomon grew some ant, ant, uh, antennas and was able to come down to the level of the ants. How, how did he communicate? How was it he was able to hear this kind of stuff? Well, that's the question we asked. We also, it was fascinating because it, we went into the seven earths and the seven heavens. What are these seven earths that they're talking about? Where are these seven earths? You studied geology. You know that there are no seven earths. There's not even seven levels of earth. That's right. And it seems to be, talk, that may seem to be borrowed from other sources. Possibly, uh, we know that Dante's Inferno talks about seven heavens and seven earths. So that could be, it's nothing more than symbolism. Also, we talked about the jinns and the meteor. That was fascinating because it was, well, we know what meteors are. They're actually made of carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide, not, how could that chase away immaterial jinn who disappear or appear? And how could it all be happening in one area of the earth, so close to earth, I didn't realize heaven was that close to earth. We know where those meteorites, they're just outside of our atmosphere. In fact, they're in our atmosphere. That's why they're burning up because they're just uh, what 50, uh, a few hundred, a hundred thousand feet above the earth. So can you see that's a real problem too. No, no one's ever asked these questions before. We're asking them as well. Then we went into some of the other ones that talked about water. And these were fascinating, the waves above and below, the fact that you can't see uh, when you get deep into water. This mm -hmm. is sheer observant observation. The waves above and below, we looked at the sequence of the verse itself, and you could see that this was not talking about the darkness of the waves. That's right. It was talking about the darkness of the clouds that were forming uh, where the waves were below it, and that it was getting so dark, talking about a tempest that was about to appear that you couldn't even see the hand in front of you. This is a huge confusion, but Muslims need to be careful. If they're going to use this as a proof text, they need to make sure that they read the whole verse and in secret. We went into the talk, the op, the problem about the two, the barrier between the two types of water, the salt water and the fresh water. And we know that this is quite observable in estuaries. This is also observable when, when uh, different oceans come together. What's fascinating is the, the verse goes on and says that no one can f cross that barrier. Right. Dabari, as you quoted, suggests that this may be a land that's between the two. Yeah, the Barzakh, he said, is just earth. Could land. be the Dead Sea, yeah. and that would suggest that this is maybe further up nor near Petra, which right. supports what Dan Gibson is coming up with. Sure. But I would, say, I would say that either whoever wrote that uh, had watched water as it comes out of an estuary after a heavy rain and brings a lot of the silt with it as it comes and, and approaches the ocean or in the case like the channel in England, the dark water which is actually brown because of the silt approaches the blue water which is the sea salt water and it starts to dissipate. In fact, the blue then takes over it. And something about this, by the way, the reason why I mentioned to you that this could be uh, an observation made somewhere in the Levant area in modern day Iraq, you know, for instance, or even the Nile River. Why would the God of Islam use examples among Bedouins who have no rivers in there? They don't have a clue what he's talking about, uh, rather than making it in front of people that are watching what's going on. Exactly. Right. And why would he say that no one can cross this barrier? Two problems. If it was a piece of land, do can't you cross a piece of land? Yes, yes you can from the salt to That's the right. fresh. That's right. You can go from the Dead Sea to the Jordan River or to the Sea of Galilee quite easily. In fact, they're, that's what they do. They travel all the time between these lands. If it's the barrier within the water, boats do it all the time. If, the, if they could cross that barrier, remember, those barriers between the salt and the, and the fresh water are there 24 hours a day, every day of the year. The only reason we can see the barrier is when there is silt there to, to and we showed the picture of the brown water coming against the blue That's sea. Right. But boats, if they're, most of the boats that are fishermen have to go out to sea. They have to go across that barrier all the time, right. every day, otherwise they'd lose their craft. Absolutely, and here's another argument. I mean, let, let's pretend that there is this barrier that stops now the sweet water from entering into the salt water. Naturally, you're gonna see rise in the water level <laughs> after it rains. 
after the water floods all the time from the mountains. We don't see that because it dissipates to go through. Yeah. I mean, it's a process. Yeah. So air after air after air, and we ended off then. Uh, we, talk, we talked about the egg shape, and we saw that they've got the wrong word. They were trying to impose a word. And this is typical of what Muslims do. They hear what's happening in the news. They hear the new discoveries. They say, oh, where can we find this in the Quran? And they went to the spreading of the earth, and they try to change that to the ostrich age. They even got the wrong egg because that's the wrong. That's not what the earth is like. But more than that, they didn't go to all the other verses that go over and over and say this is like a bed, a bread you spread, and that it had that God created and uh, spread out the earth flat, and then he cre created roads for mankind. Since when does God create roads? I don't know of any roads God has created. I mean, Man it's, creates it's definitely roads. amazing, amazing, really, some of these things. So this was an excellent summary. So where do we go from here? Well, we're going to end this one here because in the next episode, what I want to do is I want to end off with a trick question. And I want to say, let's now ask and see whether the Bible has any miracles or any scientific proof. Let's ask the same thing of the Bible in the next episode. Because I think we're going to be surprised what we find in the Bible. Amen. We've asked that of the Quran. In every case, I should be careful, careful. In almost every case, we have found these to be errors. Though Muslims put them out as scientific proofs, they're not proofs at all. They are nothing more than errors. Understandable errors in many cases. We can understand why they thought mountains were heavy, therefore they keep the earth from shaking. They didn't know anything about tectonic plates. We can see why they thought those meteorites coming across the earth probably were chasing jinn without realizing that those meteorites were in the earth's atmosphere. That's why they even are visible. We can see then why they thought that the barriers between the seas are something that God has created without thinking through, no, that's just observ observation of what's naturally happening when fresh water comes against salt water, especially after a heavy rain. These are all observable. The moon following the sun, that's observable. But from a man's perspective, the moon does follow the sun. The sun goes first and it goes down, comes back, goes up. Now, therefore, it's, the, it's what man used to think, that the earth, I mean, the earth is the center of the world. And the moon, the sun went around it. Amen. That's the case over and over again in the Quran. Absolutely. Now Amen. let's ask the same question of the Bible and let's see if these problems exist in the Bible. And I would suggest that we might be surprised at what we're going to find. And as, uh, you know, my dear brother here mentioned, you know, really a rule of thumb I tell people when it comes to the scientific miracles of the Quran, most, if not all, are based on observations, seeing things. That's a human nature. We see things, we process things, we try to come up with explanations. Maybe there is a source that we have access to, we try to report it. We brag a lot sometimes and say, hey, did you know this research said this and this and this and this? I mean, we tend to talk to each other about things like this. We get fascinated by what we hear. And in this case, the author of the Quran got fascinated by it, or the authors, you know, not just one. They began to write things like this. And remember, it's shared with people that supposedly have maybe no uh, scientific uh, training. They don't know a whole lot. They were fascinated by what they were hearing. And of course, you know, when you have a book and you have a man, you have to justify the book and the man. And that's what was going on and taking advantage probably of some level of lack of knowledge or ignorance, if you wish. And uh, we got ourselves a problem that our Muslim friends today are stuck with it because modern science have refuted it even before we touched it ourselves, who are non-scientists anyway, myself and Dr. J. Smith. And you heard from Dr. J right now that we are going to take a look at the Bible now because we anticipate an argument uh, to be raised and therefore we want to just uh, face this argument head on. So uh, our uh, dear brother, you know, always focuses on the book and the man. Let's see what our man now is going to do, do with this book. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also hit the bell so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Sira International. And together we can introduce Muslims to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you.